talk about the male duct system. I also call it the journey of sperm, where they're created and where they must get to to fertilize an egg. And um, I kind of talked about seven up in terms of emission ejaculation, but there's some details I left out. And I'm going to go through it again. I'm going to recap some stuff from last time. I'll use the app. Go back to the slides, if you will, but um, what I would like to do is start where sperm are made. They're generated to go through two phases of meiosis to cut the DNA in half, okay, half one cell. It's inside there somewhere. I'm going to hide to the albumina. Basically, you're looking at seven of which tubules. That's kind of where sperm are made. Okay. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to swim out in, in basically these tubes called the rete testes. I'll write them all on the board in a second. They collect the formed sperm from the seven of which tubules, and the sperm will then swim out of there through these very small ether and ductules, or several of them. Highlighted in green now, and they'll swim into the head of the epididymis. So in the testes, sperm are formed in seminiferous tubules. Where the formed sperm are then collected by rete testes. They're all just ducts. And then, oh, actually, that should be IS. Not ES. And then, swim out of there, they swim in through the ether and ductiles into the head of epididymis. Epididymis is a different structure. Now we're outside of the testes, so I'll put epididymis in its own column. D I D Y M I S. And there's an order, right? You, you swim first to the head of the epididymis. Then there's a body and tail. Always put of uh, epididymis, of uh, epididymis, especially if you're doing a test. You always be very thorough in your answer. Let's look at the rest of the epididymis. I described it the last time as um, 20 feet long, it's several meters in length. <coughs> it's a highly coiled tube with a head, body, and tail. It's on top of the testes. Um, yeah, so after there, you swim into the ductus deferens. Okay, I showed that to you last time. Yeah, I'm going to pull back because the ductus deferens is about eight, 18 inches long, that's what I said the last time. I mean, that's the structure that will enter the body cavity through the spermatic cord. It's going to go through the inguinal canal, over the bladder. And um, end up behind it. It's a posterior view here. The end of the uh, ductus deferens is a widened portion called the ampulla of ductus deferens. Ampule is a glass flask that's kind of widened out by someone blowing into the glass. So they describe the tube that way. Ampule. There's a lot of things in that we call ampulla. Oh, yeah. If I tag it on the end, put ampulla of ductus deferens, the wide part. If 
I tag it anywhere before the end, you know, anywhere where it's green, just call it duck is duck lens. I'm thinking about lab practicals. You have to look right at tag things. Okay, so um, let's open up prostate. Let me hide the skeleton. Show this to you before. This is review, I think. That was on today's quiz. What is it? Ejaculatory, Ejaculatory duct. It's in the prostate. And that's leading up to um, <coughs> this is the, well, what's highlighted is the prostatic urethra, part of the male duct system. Okay. Here's the ejaculatory duct. Here's ampulla ductus deferens. So after the tail of epididymis, well, by the way, I should mention, um, during ejaculation, sperm are released from the tail. Then they go into the ductus deferens. And did you notice that the ductus deferens has many layers of smooth muscle? I pointed that out because that is what helping it move up the ductus deferens to the ejaculatory duct during ejaculation as it's being released from the tail. Okay. And we have to understand the course. The ductus deferens, it begins in the scrotal sac, right? So it kind of goes from, um, I'll just put scrotum, and it gets into the body cavity, it goes through the inguinal canal, and where do you end up? Posterior bladder, that's why I describe it. Posterior to the bladder, the urinary bladder. And what I had said was it ends as a widened portion called Ampulla of ductus deferens. And remember these blah 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 of something. The blah 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 just describes something. So if a student just puts ampulla when I say identify, well you're not fully identifying it. This this means nothing. Okay? So zero credit. I just want to make that clear. But if you just put ductus deferens, well, that's not specific enough either because I put it on the ampulla. So to get full credit, <coughs> always write it out. I'm trying to drill that into you at the beginning of the term. Okay. Um, okay. iPad. Fall asleep. Let change the settings so it doesn't fall asleep. Taking notes, what comes next after the ampulla of ductus deferens? One taste quiz, ejaculatory duct. And the location, if you're looking for it on a model, inside the prostate. It's inside the prostate. Um, then, that it's basically all the structures you would list, that's end of emission. The definition of emission, which was on today's quiz, well, basically it was movement of sperm up to the urethra, that's it. Because after that's the urethra. Um, about eight inches. The 
it's got three parts. There is the I'm writing prostatic urethra, membranous urethra, spongy urethra, which is the longest part of the urethra in the last six inches. And well, um, basically, it will exit the external urethral orifice at the tip of the glans penis. So let's kind of look at those structures on the app. Got a picture of that. That's pretty good. this to you before this picture and I'll just review it again with the lights off. Alright. Identified in highlighted in green. I think that's my big fat fingers to touch it. That's jacketory duct. That's prostatic urethra. That thin part, it's called the membranous urethra. I mean, what's the name of that full membrane? Deep transverse perineal. It has to go through that membrane, hence membranous urethra. And then if I put the pin anywhere inside that tube, what are you going to call it? Spongy urethra. That's it. The external urethral orifice. Let me see if they highlight it. They don't really highlight it. It's that uh, tip of the glands, penis. That's it. That's the male duct system. If you look at the pictures from the atlas, you can study the same thing if you chose not to buy the app. Um, the picture on the right, they cut it open so you can see the duct system inside. But let me go to the next slide. There's that. But I like this one a little better. We kind of dropped this one from the more recent editions, but I still use it. They show just the ducts on this one. They strip everything else away so we can focus on what we're talking about. Seminiferous tubules, rete testes, several efferent ductules leading to the head, body, and tail of ductus deferens. Well, from the tail, or sperm is released from ejaculation, it continues on into the muscular tube called the ductus deferens. And um, if you want to sterilize a male, like right here, you could cut and ligate. So that as during ejaculation, sperm can't go anywhere. So we have to follow the ductus deferens all the way to the posterior aspect of the bladder. So don't confuse the seminal vesicle with the ampulla of ductus deferens. I'll talk about the uh, glands that contribute to semen volume in a second there. But both of those share the ejaculatory duct. Right. Okay. I took a picture of our model. It kind of looks like a picture from the book there. In this picture, um, it's showing you the bladder cut open. Okay, I'm not concerned with that, but you can see how it's continuous with the prostatic urethra, membranous urethra, and then the rest of this is spongy urethra and the external urethral orifice. And if you uh, take a close look at the pictures there, the red arrow is pointing to the orifice of the ejaculatory duct. Well, in this view, you can see it clearly. But from this view, you have to look for like, tiny holes. Okay, I don't want that to escape your eye. Okay, the opening of the ejaculatory duct into the prostatic urethra. Now, sperm need um, a support <coughs> system. They kind of need help. They can't make the journey all the way to the egg to fertilize by themselves. They need um, cis semen. 
semen contains a sperm, but basically uh, it's a fluid that contains nutrition for a sperm's journey in the female reproductive tract as the sperm swim to fertilize an oocyte. Now we're going to talk about the uh, three accessory glands that contribute to semen content. They mix with the sperm. Let's the sperm go from tail of epididymis to the ejaculatory duct, and they're all ejaculated together. I just kind of point to them here on this figure. Oh, well, I'm pointing to the, 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 the arrow in red, the prostate, let's do that first. So, Accessory glands. Accessory glands are glands that they're not in the duct, right? I just went through the male duct system. And I didn't mention any of these glands because they're not in the duct. The sperm don't have to swim through them. But these ducts, these glands empty into the male duct system and they mix with the sperm. So that's what accessory means. Not a part of the duct system, but they secrete things into it. All right, so the prostate, you can call it the prostate or the prostate gland, either is acceptable. It's just inferior to the urinary bladder. It's right in front of the rectal wall. Inferior to urinary bladder. Anterior to rectal wall. In a prostate exam, the proctologist inserts his finger into the rectum and he can palpate the prostate through the rectal wall and feel if it's a hot prostate, it's large or Anyways, <clears throat> Pro prostate cancer is the number one cancer in men. So that's why at the age of 50, you want to get a prostate exam. That's where it is. It's basically a fibromuscular gland that surrounds the prostatic urethra. Fibromuscular gland surrounding. Prostatic urethra. <clears throat> I listed the secretions there. It contributes about a third of the semen volume. Uh, in a typical ejaculation, you'll have a few mils, milliliters of um, semen, and this contributes about a third of that. It's a milky acidic fluid, it's acidic because of citrate, which is needed for cell metabolism. So I'll kind of list that in an important secretion. It also contracts during uh, ejaculation. So, one thing to note is, well, where is it draining into? It's draining into the male duct system. The citric acid is draining into the prostatic urethra. Okay, I wrote it there. And I think that's a study guide question. The students always ask me that. Um, where is it empty? That was obvious. Okay, here's another one. Uh, the seminal vesicle, it contributes about 60 centimeters, 60% uh, 60, 60 of semen volume. It secretes a thick yellow alkaline fluid, and its duct joins vas deferens at the ejaculatory duct. Okay, seminal vessel. I'm writing alkaline. Secretions, they're kind of, these secretions will neutralize the citric acid 
the prostate. I'm going to say they empty into the uh, ejaculatory duct. Sperm, but the sperm's coming from the ampulla. The ampulla of Duchess X. The bubble urethral gland is last. They're a small P-shaped gland, and the name of the gland tells you where to look for it. Okay. And you have other things that have bulbo, like bulb of penis, right? Bulbal spongiosis. They're, they're, they're by there, right? So look for them next to the UG diaphragm. So that's where the bulb of the penis would be. And uh, well, they're P-sized, and their duct will empty in two. I mean, I don't know if you can identify, but that's going to be the uh, spongy urethra. glands are, are still called Cowper's glands. That's an older term, but I'll accept it if you use it. Bulbal urethral gland is what they're called now. And their secretion is a, is a clear fluid whose job is to neutralize any trace urine that would be in the spongy urethra before ejaculation. Spongy urethra. And yeah, just get rid of the urine that's there. So, two to five mil for ejaculation. One ejaculation will contain anywhere from 20 to 100 million sperm per milliliter. Okay, so that's kind of what the numbers show for a man to be fertile, to have kids. So 20 to 100 million sperm per mill seed. Now you only need one to fertilize, but it takes that many so that the one can make it. Okay. And I show a picture of the female reproductive tract there. And there's other things, well, not this slide. I mean, if there's anything I test you on that's going to be in the semen, besides what I've already mentioned, it's on this list. So I'm going to note the slide. So the ejaculate, <coughs> note slide. Which slide? This slide. Okay, it's very easy. And uh, let me mention some things. Um, there's prostaglandins that can dissolve the mucus plug at the cervix. The cervix is the inferior one-third of the uterus. Here's the vagina. Sperm is deposited here in the fornix, and uh, it must swim up there. So around this area where the ovulate, ovulated egg is, okay, so it's got to get in there. And then so those prostaglandins may cause a, a peristalsis of the uterine sweet muscle. Peristalsis is a rhythmic contraction. 
It's like you're washing the sperm up to here. There's things that increase the sperm motility. There's things that are alkaline. There's things that are antibacterial. And this farvinolysin will free the sperm from the sticky semen so it can swim to the egg. Um, they say it takes about five minutes for sperm to swim from here to there. Okay. So that, that's a lot of, a cell can't swim that far in five minutes, so there's a lot of help is what I'm trying to say. Well, this kind of transitions nicely. I want to start the female repro anatomy. Now remember, this is anatomy physiology. That was just anatomy. I didn't teach the physiology yet. You're like, what? You signed up for both. So I'm just telling you. The students have asked me that. Oh, so you're done with male? I'm happy, guys. I don't want to surprise you. I thought you were going with male. Uh, no, I'm going back to the physiology later. Sometimes I do blend the two. Not for repro. I do anatomy, anatomy, physiology, physiology for one gender and then the other. So let's start female repro. Well, we can start with the same kind of picture that I started with for males and show you the pelvis half section, uh, pro section, or mid sagittal section, kind of right down the sagittal plane. And you can see most of the reproductive structure is right here uterus, vagina, and external genitalia there. Like, for example, if you um, just look at the, the female reproductive organs, you have a picture like that. And so, the female's contribution to reproduction. For males, there's the three E's. To complement that, I've come up with what's called uh, the three receives that the female's going to reproduce. Well, I mean, so what I mean by that is the first thing that happens for the most important thing, I think, is that there must be ovulation. And that ovulated cell, the oocyte, the egg, must be received by the oviduct or the uterine tube. And it's going to wait there for sperm to come and fertilize it. That's the first thing that must happen. And that has nothing to do with sex, okay? That has to do with the ovarian cycle, which is driven by hormones not sex, okay? And that happens typically in the middle of the month, or the middle of a cycle, about day 14. That's the first thing. The uterine tube, and I'll point these things out in a second here. The uterine tube must receive, right, an ovulated Count days on the menstrual cycle, about day 14. Okay, that's the first thing. Well, then the second thing is, um, for males, um, orgasm is necessary for fertilization because the semen has the sperm. So, the second thing is, um, the vagina, the female vagina, must receive ejaculate. And what I'll show you is, uh, during sex, the junction where vagina meets uterus is a recess called the fornix. So the fornix is a little space where junction, uh, or vagina and 
uh, cervix are. And during sex, that space, the fornix kind of expands and receives a pool of ejaculate. And, uh, so I'll say in an expanded fornix. So you kind of like have a little, it's called a seminal pool. And then after sex, when things kind of shrink back to as they were before, the cervix will swoop down into this seminal pool and suck up the semen, okay? And that way the sperm can find its way to the, uh, the site of fertilization, which we say is the most typical site of fertilization where the two cells merge is right around here. Here's the uterine tube. Here's where it would be ovulated. See this little scar, this little yellow pusculation? Um, every time you ovulate, you leave, leave, you leave a scar. Okay. So um, a young girl who hasn't had her first ovulation, the ovary would be smooth and pink. But in a sexually mature female with many ovulations, it'll look kind of scarred and pusculated. Mm -hmm. And then so they had oocyte waiting there, sperm fertilizes it's there, and so the typical site of fertilization is the ampulla of the uterine tube. Now I'll go through the steps of fertilization in the development chapter, not now. Notice that the female uterine tube also has an ampulla. That's why I said if you just put ampulla, you're describing nothing because both men and women have it. Okay, so great, fertilization happens, but you can't have a pregnancy there in that little tube. Um, it needs to move. About a week later, it'll move into the womb into the uterus, right around there, inside here. So this, my third receives um, is that the uterus, the uterine cavity must receive, well, I guess we can call it like, you know, a fertilized egg. I'll say uterine, the uterine cavity must receive fertilized egg. I don't like that term, fertilized egg, because really when we get to development, it'll be about a week later, and the, and the structure is actually called a blastocyst, a little ball of cells. So I'll put blastocyst in parentheses. But I use fertilized egg to be gentle. I think people know what that means. The sperm fertilize the egg, basically. You've allowed fertilization, but now the uterine cavity must receive it for implantation. Okay. And then, well, from there, we'll, we'll just talk about what happens after that when we get to chapter 28. But for now, for reproduction, I think this is sufficient. The three receives. You get ovulation, receive that. Uterine tube receives the ovulated oocyte. Second thing, um, the ejaculate must be there because it has the sperm. It must receive that in the expanded fornix. The third thing, if fertilization occurs about a week later, okay, it should implant. So notice that the first receives is about day 14, midway through a cycle. Um, typical gestation is like, you know, 38 weeks. So that's why um, if, if you're pregnant, you go to the doctor. I mean, what's the first question he asks the mother? What's the, when, when, do you remember the first day of your last menstrual period? Because that's the last physical thing you could probably remember. And he just adds two weeks to it. Because you assume 
two weeks later, that's when you conceived. So, you know, 40 weeks. Uh, but let, let's look at the, um, the app here. I want to show you the app and show you some of the structures. So here's the female pelvis. Orient you. <coughs> so the first receives are looking into the uh, vaginal orifice there. But let me remove the uh, uh, skeleton that's going to get in the way here. Let me hide some things. Let me turn off. Oh, whoops, I didn't do that. Let's get rid of the nervous system. Hide that. Let me show you from the side here. This is a side view. Notice how the uterus is flexed over the vaginal canal. There's vaginal canal, there's the cervix, and that's, that's a flexed over is the uterus. That's normal, there's variations of that, but that's kind of the normal flexed position of uterus. Bladder would be here, and then there is the external genitalia, there's a uterine cavity. Now in males, we have the spermatic cord. In females, that's called the round ligament. Okay. They don't have a spermatic core. Uh, let me hide some things here so you can see the difference. <coughs> so I'm going to hide that. I'm going to hide that. I'm going to rotate a little bit. So we're looking at the junction of um, vagina uterus at the cervix. And the fornix is that little recess right there or right there. I mean, it goes 360 degrees all the way around, right? But anyways, they say sperm can live there for a few days. So <coughs> ovulation is one day. So you have about a, a four day window, I guess, to, to conceive. I mean, doctors who practice this for decades may tell you something different, but that's what most textbooks will say. I mean, I think the day, the one day you ovulate is the day to conceive. Uh, which you can't really know when that is. There are kits that are out there that can test the hormones that can predict it, but basically that's the best day to get pregnant in my, in my view today, Yavli. That, that, that's the first receive. The ejaculate goes there. I said the points can expand during uh, sex. Um, the other receives I said for ovulation, they show a little pustulation there. That would be an ovulation, and so it's got to like wait in there for sperm. It can wait for about a day. We'll look inside the oviduct, okay? So the uterine tube is also called the oviduct. So that's another receives. And the third thing was, if you fertilize, the uterine cavity must receive that. <coughs> so, let me kind of pull back a little bit. Let me hide this. Fertilization occurred on day 14. The uh, conceptus, the fertilized egg, it'll stay here for about a week. <clears throat> okay. And then it'll be allowed into the uterine cavity. It'll first be floating around free, and hopefully it sticks and implants, right? Right where I'm pointing. That would be the best place for implantation. Okay. You could implant in other places. You could implant down here, and that might cause complications later. I mean, the best spot is this largest part of the uterus. So that was the other receives. Okay. I want to move, move away from this and go back to the PowerPoint slides, but are there any questions on the three receives? Let's look at the perineal region there. It's the same as before, so I don't have to re-describe it. About the shape of a bike seat in the space between thighs and buttocks. <coughs> well, if you, if you 
become an OBGYN, I guess that view is your life. Okay. You, um, you spend all your time helping women give birth and help them through the pregnancy. Here's a dissected picture. And uh, we see some of the same structures as before. We see, you should still be able to identify those two erector muscles. They are called ischiocavernosis, um, bulbal spongiosis. Cavernosis in this picture, it's wrapping around what's called the crust of clitoris. The clitoris in females is erectile tissue, just like in males. Wraps crust of clitoris. The bulbal spongiosis wraps around an erectile tissue called the vestibular bulb. Right there. There's the bulbal spongiosis muscle. It's dissected away on this side so you can see the vestibular bulb. It's just a bulb of erectile tissue. I mean, it's like the bulb of the penis, right? Flaps. Vestibular bulb. So what I should mention is, you can't really see it here, but I want you to know it. The vestibular bulb, what it does is, um, during sex arousal, the bulb becomes filled with blood, and it compresses the greater vestibular gland, which will secrete um, fluid into the vaginal orifice to aid in intercourse. Compresses what's called the greater vestibular gland. So know the bulb and the gland. Well, that's not shown there, I'll show it to you later. But you also got deep and superficial transverse perineal for the female, just as you did for the male as well. So I'll just list them here. Yeah, deep and superficial. Transverse perineal. Always remember that usually our books and models, they show the superficial transverse perineal more as a band of muscle. You might see that that way on cadavers. Um, the deep one is more like a flat membrane. Yeah. And it's deeper. Well, I want to look at the, um, the external genitalia. That was the picture on the left. Here, here we have um, the mons pubis. It's the area with pubic hair. The pubic bone got that name because it's covered with skin with pubic hair. have the labia, uh, labia majora minora. The labia majora is basically skin with hair follicles. Space called the vestibule. So I'll put vestibule. 
vestibule. Just the physical space contained within the labia, both of them. Now, superiorly, what you can't see are the crest of clitoris, but you can see the glands clitoris. It just says clitoris, but technically it's glands clitoris. And there's a skin that covers the glands clitoris. You may see it labeled, um, I don't have a label here, but it would be called the prepuce, the skin covering glands. Covered partially by prepuce. Inferior to the glans clitoris is the external urethral orifice, and inferior to that is the vaginal orifice. So basically, I'm just going to put both of those structures for you to know to identify. Be able to identify external urethral orifice and vaginal orifice. in this area. There's a blank picture you can study. Here's basically the model that kind of shows most of those structures. And this model, I didn't take a picture of that. I took that picture. You can see most of the things uh, that I'm talking about here. Well, I'll just point out what I can see here. Not quite everything, but um, ischial cavernosus has two heads here. There's bulbal spongiosus, labia majora minora. There's the deep, there's the superficial transverse perineal. So I can't see that in that view. Let's kind of look at another view of the pelvis, the superior view. Um, I do want you to know the name of the muscles that support all the pelvic viscera, all the female reproach structures. That's important to know. Because, well, you don't want your uterus to prolapse down in your vagina. And basically, these help um, support all the pelvic viscera. So that's why they're on your study list. The muscles of levator cani. And here are the three that are typically shown in our models. So you have pelvic diaphragm, not to be confused with UG diaphragm. The UG diaphragm is the deep transverse perineal. diaphragm are the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, most notably, levator ani. And levator ani is a muscle group consisting of pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, Pubo It's not shown well on models, and I'm going to put it in parentheses. I, I'm not going to ask it out loud, but I do want you to know that it's a part of that muscle group. 
but the first two are usually shown nicely on our models. I tend to ask you that. Now, not a part of levator anode, but still a part of the uh, pelvic diaphragm and the pelvic floor is coxa juice. So study those three muscles. attachments or anything like that. I mean, just identify them. I mean, no, their function. They, they support the pelvic viscera. That, that's their function. That's why I mentioned these things. So, all right, that supports. Viscera is content, so all the stuff, right? Viscera is the stuff in this area. Labels on, labels off picture there. Look at this briefly. So here's a pelvis, half of it, with all the stuff out of it. You can still see things down here. You don't have to worry about the rectum anus, but you do have to worry about the vaginal canal, the urethra. So if I put a, if I point to the orifice part, it's the external urethral orifice, labia uh, minora and majora. You see clitoris there. And there's different parts of the clitoris. Now the models don't really do it justice. Let me use the app to show you the different parts of clitoris. We'll come right back here. I want to highlight the whole clitoris and just isolate it. That's what it looks like, the whole thing. Let me put it back in with the other structures. There's the prepuce covering it. So the tip is the glands. Let me kind of fade others so you can kind of see the whole thing. All right. You hide the prepuce. So there's the body of clitoris. And then the rest of it would just be the crust. body and cross. Well, I got the app on. Remember I had you write down the vestibular bowl or bowl of vestibule, same thing. Therefore, this one is what? Greater vestibular gland. And if you look closely, I can just zoom in, you don't have to look closely. We know it's a gland because it has a duct, right? That was pre lubrication into the vestibule. Put some things back in. Identify muscle in green. I need to read it up there. Bulbo spongiosus. And what about the one along the pelvis there? Ischio cavernosus, wrapping those structures I said before, the bulb the vestibule and the crust of the torus. I mean, if you hide it, you can kind of see it in there. Well, anyway, I just wanted to show you that. Let's go back to this. If 
you're looking at the clitoris, um, I think here you could see the, the glands, clitoris, and the body, but not the cross. Right. Let's talk about the ovaries. There's a picture of them inside the pelvic cavity. Uh, and let's talk about the peritoneum that covers all of these things, including the ovary. Okay, it's called a broad ligament. And, uh, it's like if you took a bed sheet and you just kind of dropped it over all the female recall structures, and it covers it on both sides, like a double, double pinch of covering. And there's three parts of the broad ligament you should know. There's the mesosalpings, the mesovarium, and the mesometrium. The mesosalpings is the part of the broad ligament that provides a covering for the uterine tube. Salpings means trumpet. You can think of the uterine tube as being trumpet shaped. <clears throat> okay, the mesovarium covers what it refers to the, um, this double pinching here, but it provides support to the ovary. It's covering the whole ovary. Okay, it supports the ovary. Here's the volume. Covers ovary. Uh, and then the broadest part is that provides lateral support for the uterus is the, uh, the mesovitrium. Supports uterus laterally. So to make sense of the picture, you have to know what you're looking at. If you take, what they did was they, they made a section right through here, and your, your eyeball is looking at it from the side. That's the relation. So here's the uterine tube. When you wrap over it, that's called the mesosalpings. When you wrap the whole ovary, that's called the mesovarium, and this is uh, going to the uterus. It's the mesometrium. So let's look at the same structures in the app to give you the 3D advantage. Let me try to get it right here. So let me orient us. Let's start from anterior. That's always easy to start from. Here's anterior. There's the, the labia, the clitoris. So now let's go posterior. Go like that. I'm going to try to highlight the miso salpings. Before I highlight it, you can see that um, what they did here, they're, they're pretty good. And they try to show you the tube inside a covering. So I'm going to highlight the covering. That covering over the uterine tube is the mesosalpings. That covering all over the ovary is the mesovarium. And that covering um, 
it doesn't show you the covering, but basically this covers the whole thing. What are you tell me? What is it? What was the last one? Yeah, it's the mesometrium. Very good. here, going back to the PowerPoint slides. This was the next slide. Here's a model we have in the room. And this is the only one that shows all three clearly in my opinion. Does, does that make sense? These three here. Well, measles salpates, do you see how like there's a little bend there? That's kind of where I would call it mesovarian. Lateral to the uterus, mesometrium. So boom, boom, boom. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the uterus itself.